Hey, it's Mark Podolsky, The Land Geek, with your favorite niche real estate website, www.thelandgeek.com. And today's guest, we're going to talk about something that we haven't really talked about in a long time, which is commercial real estate options, I believe. Yeah, commercial real estate lease options. Scott Todd, you ever talk about commercial lease options before? Uh, I don't think that we've talked about that, but I'm interested. I'm interested. So we're going to learn a lot about uh, our guests, but I'd be remiss if I didn't really properly introduce Scott Todd. You know, him, you love him. ScottTodd.net, landmoto.com. If you're not automating your Craigslist and your Facebook postings, postingdomination.com forward slash the land geek. Get smarter, learn anything about anything, investorninjas.com. Today's podcast is sponsored by none other than flight school learn how 16 weeks can literally transform your life go up that mountain of land investing with yours truly scott todd your land geek sherpa quickly safely efficiently start making passive income without renters without rehabs without renovations without rodents learn more go to landgeek.com forward slash training our guest today is peter conti he is the founder of real estate 101 which provides step-by-step -step guidance for commercial real estate investors. He's the co-author of Commercial Real Estate Investing for Dummies and currently lives in beautiful Chesapeake Bay in Annapolis, Maryland. Peter started out as an auto mechanic, but bought his first commercial property 30 years ago and has never looked back. He's partnered with thousands of people all across the world to, uh, to them to make the transition to becoming successful real estate investors. His focus now is on commercial lease options, which involves acquiring commercial property using owner carry and commercial master lease terms combined with an assignment contract to create sizable upfront paydays. Peter Conti, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me on the show. So Peter, let's just rewind the tape. Tell us what it was like when you were an auto mechanic and you, you woke up one day and you thought, hey, commercial real estate. Oh my goodness. I was uh, scared to death. <laughs> I came from a family of seven kids and uh, uh, my parents basically got us together and said, we expect you all to go to college, but we obviously can't help you. So good luck. Um, I kind of <laughs> didn't, didn't have anyone guiding me. I didn't even realize there were grants and things available. So I ended up not going to college. I was working as an auto mechanic and I realized that real estate was kind of my one, one way out to have some more opportunities in life. And I was uh, really af afraid I was going to blow it. So when did you wake up to commercial real estate? Uh, I got involved in commercial right from the very beginning. Uh, one of the things that I liked about commercial properties is that I could determine the value using some simple formulas rather than houses to me at that point in time was confusing because it seemed like the, the value was based on the emotion of, you know, what someone was willing to pay for a particular property recently. And uh, commercial just made a lot more sense to me. So in the commercial real estate realm, like when I think of commercial real estate, I automatically think of a high rise building. But when you think of commercial real estate, what do you think of? Well, it's everything from uh, small, small apartment buildings. Uh, you know, a lot of my students start out going after just the five to 50 unit part of the market that a lot of the bigger investors and uh, real estate investment trusts obviously don't bother with smaller areas like that. Includes mixed use, shopping centers, self-storage, mobile home parks, all of that. So the interesting thing right now is with what's going on with the economy and the whole coronavirus thing, it's just really upset everything. So who knows what's going to happen with commercial real estate and residential real estate for that matter, which is why I feel this is one of the very best times I've seen in my entire 30 years to go out and acquire properties. Uh, yeah, I, I, I can only imagine. Scott, Scott Todd, what are your thoughts? You know, I, um, I, I look at commercial real estate. I like, I like the model, right? Like I like, I like that little niche that you're in there. And, you know, like I've looked at this multiple times. I, I honestly really have, right? Like I get shiny object syndrome and I go out there and I start driving. I start looking at these things and I start thinking. And then, you know, like the, the thing that I don't like is I don't like the concept of going to the bank and asking for a mortgage on, on this property. Like 
I, I'll be honest with you. A couple of years ago, I had shiny object syndrome and a multifamily deal went out there. We put it under contract. They go through the credit check, you know, like you, you had to go to multiple banks. Literally next thing I know, my, my credit score is destroyed. My partner's was destroyed. It was, it was a mess, right? Like it, all because of all the credit checks that they had to go through. And it was a pain. It sucked. And I ran back to land where I have no banks. So like, is that the biggest downside behind commercial real estate is the financing component of it? Uh, it certainly is. If you do it conventionally, that's, that's why I don't deal with banks. Um, you know, I've, I've acquired, and one of the things I teach my students to do is go out and acquire properties without having to go out and qualify for a mortgage and without having to make big down payments, which, you know, if you think about the current market, why would anyone want to, you know, put a, put a down payment or get a, try and get a loan in this environment to acquire any type of property. Um, I'm, I'm real big on structuring transactions where you've got all the upside with little to none of the downside. Okay, that's really interesting. Let, let's, let's get into that um, a little bit more in detail. So I, I, Scott and I own a mobile home park. And, you know, let's say that our cap is 10%, so our net operating income is $100,000. And we want a um, million dollars for it. So you would say to us, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll buy it for a million dollars. But Mark and Scott, you need to own or finance it. And Scott says to me, well, Mark, I, I don't, I want a million bucks. I don't want to finance this thing. Um, what do we, like, what happens then? How do you convince Scott to, to not take the million bucks and, and go through it and, and take a little bit of the risk and carry the paper? I don't. I don't. That's a great question. And uh, that's a, uh, a common misconception I think that a lot of people have is that somehow we've got the, some secret ninja negotiating tactics or something to talk someone into doing a, a creative transaction or carrying the financing when that's not the best option for them. So just like someone who's buying houses, if they're going to go out and buy a house, they're not going to get a great deal on a house. It's all completely fixed up was listed two weeks ago and everything's in perfect condition and the owner has no motivation to uh, do anything right away. The deals we put together tend to be done with people who are, are motivated or they're in a, a situation or a problem. They've maybe inherited the property. They never really wanted to be or intended to be a landlord. They maybe live far away from the property. The property has degraded somewhat. Maybe the vacancy rate is up. Um, we like properties where they're owned by people that we refer to as lazy landlords, people who've just owned it long enough that they just really don't care. They've decided to keep their rent slow so that their tenants never move to decrease the hassle factor for them or the property management company. And that gives us a, a nice upside when we control that property using something like a commercial master lease. But to, to answer your question, you know, big picture, you basically need somebody who's got a problem or a situation that you can come in and be the hero and solve their situation using some creative methods rather than talking, talking someone into doing the deal. Uh, a good example of that is we Scott tend Todd, not, not um, to work with uh, commercial brokers. We tend to I've work lost, with, I can't hear. Yeah, Mark, I, I got it. Can you hear me? I, I heard Peter, don't worry. Yeah, you know, Peter, it's funny because um, it's funny that you're saying that because the one thing that I think of a lot is a lot of times people will ask me um, when I'm teaching or uh, when I'm out of boot camps or whatever, hey, um, you know, what about like almost that same question? How do I convince somebody to go do something? And your, your answer is very simple. You, you don't, right? Like you cannot force somebody to do anything. You really can't. They have to, they have, to have a problem and you have to provide the solution to the problem. And I guess what you're saying too is really what it comes down to is talking to enough people and you'll find some portion of the, some percentage of the people that have a problem that you can fix. Otherwise, just keep, keep looking for the problem. Is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think there's also an element of having a willingness to reach out and connect with people and get them to open up to you to start sharing, you know, what's really going on. 
I found that you guys have, I'm sure have found this as well, being in real estate. If you ask somebody, you know, what do you want? The answer is always, oh, we want all cash, right? So sure. sometimes it takes a little bit of creating a connection and getting to know someone and find out what's going on, what else they've tried to find out, uh, you know, what, what, what's really going on. And um, typically, you know, some of the, the properties that have problems or owners that have problems, they tend to go together, right? If an owner has issues, maybe the property hasn't been taken care of or if there's deferred maintenance or just hasn't been run like a business, which as you know, is, is bad for any type of property. And what we see is we see a property where they, they want to get the price that they thought it was worth one day when it was, you know, 98% occupied. Now it's 85% occupied and they expect to get that same price. So the basic conversation is, hey, look, I understand you, you know, you want to get X, X dollars. Um, from what I can see, anyone else looking at this deal is going to look at it the same way I am. Here's the situation. It's, you know, whatever this, this is, the vacancies up, the, the rents are, are below what they need to be. There's a whole bunch of deferred maintenance. It needs a new roof. The, the uh, parking lot is going to need to be repaid within a couple of years. Anyone else is going to look at this thing the same way that I am. So should we talk about some ways to maybe come up with something that would work or, or probably not? I mean, you're going to end up having this conversation with another buyer later on down the road. Why don't we go ahead and have that conversation right now today? I love it. I love it. So Peter, let's go back to our, our mobile home park that is worth a million bucks. It's throwing off 100000 a year in income. But now the situation is different. Scott and I are old and fat and happy. We haven't done anything to the property in five years. Every time Scott goes and visits, he brings a whole thing of Wawa donuts. We just eat them. We don't even look around at, at the houses anymore. We don't care. So eventually though, we get that call. We're annoyed. The tenants are complaining. We want to sell. And you come up and you say, hey, look, here's our creative option. Walk me through the lease option aspect of it and how you're going to make money with it. Well, uh, let's back up a little bit. One of the first things that I'm going to find out is what is it that you're trying to achieve? Because I found that property owners, a lot of times they, they have this idea of something they want to achieve and they just think they're going to achieve it by doing an outright cash sale of their property. No, so, we, we don't want a cash sale. We want, we want the cash flow. Right. We're, we're happy to owner finance. Sure. Oh, okay. Um, so the, the conversation I'm going to have with the property owner is I'm going to find out, you know, if you did sell, what would you be doing with that? If someone's telling me, oh, well, we want a 1031 into another deal, that's obviously not a good prospect to be spending time with. But if you tell me, like many people have over the years, that, well, we're just, you know, I want to retire, I want to have cash flow, I want to not have to worry about stuff anymore, I just want to kind of I'm at the point in my life when I want to start to take it easy. Um, you know, I had a, a, a seller one time tell me, well, I'm just going to take the money and put it in the bank and I'm going to get 5%. Well, that was, you know, a few years back when you could get 5% in a bank account. And we put a deal together where he carried back almost all the financing at 6% interest. And uh, uh, so we bought that property for 600000 and then sold it four years later for 900000 So, you know, not a huge deal on a commercial basis, but that maybe give some of the listeners an idea of, of what you can put together and how those dynamics go. No, so, no, that's great. But then walk me through the lease option piece of it. Yeah, the, the uh, a commercial lease option is similar to a lease purchase on a house. If some of our listeners have maybe done one of those or heard about those or at least understand a lease purchase on a house with a commercial property, say an apartment building, it's the same basic concept what you do is you agree to pay the property owner a set amount each and every month, which is the lease amount that could be tied into enough to cover the payments. It could be tied into one of the things we do is we look at the cash flow. Uh, for example, your mobile home park has gotten a certain cash flow. If we look at the, the uh, P and L statements over the past couple of years, if there's a way that I could put a deal together that got you that same average cash flow, over the next five to 10 years, and uh, you wouldn't have to worry about anything. So the investor comes in, agrees to make a monthly payment. The investor runs the entire 
project, everything from uh, fixing up the units, uh, renting them out, uh, evictions, collections, paying the property taxes, everything from A to Z is completely done by the investor. And of course the investor is collecting the rents out of that, they're making the payment to the owner. And you need to agree on two other things. One is how long of a term you're going to go. And the other thing is what the purchase price is gonna be. Obviously from the investor standpoint, we want that purchase price to be as low as possible. Uh, from the property owner's perspective, they, you know, they're probably gonna want that to be as high as possible. Uh, but the, generally the way these things fall into place is the purchase price is gonna be probably fairly close to what the property's current value is worth in its current condition which is why I mentioned we like properties where maybe the rents are below market or there's a higher than normal vacancy, there's some upside to the property. So basically you're locking that price in, you have a period of time. I don't like deals that are any shorter than generally about five years. Um, when you're doing terms, deals, more time is your friend. Uh, if you have longer time period in a deal, to me that means that there's a, a, a much more likely chance you're gonna make a larger amount of money and you're more assured of making that profit. You compare that to someone who puts a deal together with a, you know, a six month or a, a one year master lease on a property, unless there's some, some uh, you know, huge factor like the rents are 20% below market that you can uh, rapidly make that change and increase the value of the property. I don't like deals like that where the pressure's on. I like to get into a deal ideally have the property be generating enough money to be making the payments to the owner and then let time be our friend. Let, let the uh, tenants in there make their rents. Uh, well, <laughs> normally make their rents. Some of that's not happening right now, but uh, make their rents, pay that mortgage down, do other things to increase the net operating income of the property, as you know, which increases the value. So Scott Todd, what are your thoughts? You know, Mark, that's, that is one of the, that is honestly one of the things I like about commercial real estate or, you know, uh, in that aspect is that you, you get more, more, basically more doors to cover you instead of one door. And you also get that, that pay down of, of equity, right? That, that mortgage gets paid down, you build up equity. It's not like you're necessarily making those payments. It, it is kind of scary though. When, when you read stories that say like 30% of renters last month didn't pay their rent payment. It's like, eek, there goes your profit. There goes your profit. But that said, I do believe that America will always be stronger, you know, tomorrow than it is today. I truly believe that. And if that's the case, then, you know, ultimately this might be a good time to go buy something. Yeah, it could be historically good because there's going to be so much fear and doubt and uncertainty. And if you own this asset and you're at that point in your life where you don't want the headache anymore, Peter's strategy is like, you know, just music to your ears. Well, let's just touch real quick on the risk factor. Um, when you structure these correctly, all basically you've got a deal in place where comparing it to a conventional deal, if you put 30% down and signed personally and guaranteed a loan on a commercial piece of property, you're, you're uh, maybe not sleeping so good right now. <laughs> Um, with a commercial master lease, when it's structured properly, the way we do it, basically it's structured where if you ever wanted to exit that deal and, and you know, we're not going to go into a deal thinking that may, we'll just get out if it doesn't work out. Obviously, we do our due diligence. We're going to only go into a deal if we think we can make it a winner. But worst case, if, you know, if things keep going and people aren't paying their rent for another, you know, five years from now, Worst case, if you're in a commercial master lease, if you have it structured correctly, and I'm not an attorney, check with your own attorney on this, but ours are structured where we just stop making the payments. If the, the property can't afford to make the payments, we can't pay the owner. There's default language in the agreement, which states that the owner has the right to take the property back and they retain all amounts that we've paid him to date as full and comp complete liquidated damages and hold us harmless. So it's a way to go into real estate right now when things are very uncertain, provide a sentence of certainty to the commercial property owners out there to say, hey, I'm gonna handle this thing for you, while also knowing that worst case, if the sky continues falling or uh, who knows, I mean, you could, you could have, I've always figured that, you know, a dirty uh, bomb could go off in the neighborhood or the next door property, the owner could have some 
undisclosed environmental contaminants on the property. There's stuff like that that happens. I like to have an exit out of a deal, worst case, where you can get out of it with, with minimal damage. I, I love the model, Scott Todd. I don't know why everyone doesn't do this as, their, as the way to get into commercial real estate. You don't have to put a lot of money in, if any money in, because the owner is, is doing the paper and carrying the note. You don't have to come up with um, even a big down probably because they, you know, you're solving that problem for them. They just want the cash flow. You don't have to deal with the outside banks, which as we discussed in the beginning of the podcast was a major issue. And then it's just kind of a due diligence game and seeing where can we improve the property where the properties that we're going after are distressed in some way. So there's lots of opportunities to typically improve the property. So in the sense that they haven't kept up with, um, you know, the, the, the roofy, the roofs, or they haven't raised the rents. Um, there's improvements everywhere. I like it, Peter. Scott, Todd, what do you, what do you think? I, I like it too, Mark. I, I think uh, you got to do some research, but it sounds like a good way of doing something. All right. Well, I love it. So Peter Conti, we are at that point in the podcast now where I think your mentorship has been fantastic, but we want to get one more tip, a website, a resource, a book, something else actionable. The Art of Passive Income listeners ago, improve their businesses, improve their lives. What have you got? Yeah, I'll give you two tips today. Um, one of the, the skills that I, I teach my students and I think has been really helpful to, to me over my 30 years of investing is being able to create a connection either with brokers or property owners and involves being able to, to quickly create rapport. It's the business of, I think it is creating friends fast on purpose. There's a book available called Instant Rapport. It's by Michael Brooks. I believe the paperwork is still available on Amazon. Great little study guide on, on how to get up to speed on creating rapport quickly. Uh, the other thing I'm gonna say is that, that right now really is an amazing time to get going investing in real estate, whether it's with commercial properties or investing in land or any of the other myriad of techniques out there. Right now, let's, let's face it, if you're quarantined and home, you got lots of time to be focused on doing something new. Um, people right now are generally home and available. They're watching their email, they're answering their phones these days. It's easy to get a hold of people. It's just an awesome time to get out there and get started. So my recommendation is to those of you listening to this, get out there, just, you know, pick, pick something, pick a strategy, a method, a, a teacher, and get out there and start taking some steps and see what you can get going right now, because this is the very best time I've ever seen to get going investing in real estate. All right. Fantastic. Scott Todd, what's your tip of the week? Mark, check out this uh, website, Ele Eloquence. Yeah, I just put in the chat for you. E-L-O-C-A-N-C-E, -E, Eloquence. And what it does is it takes your reading list. You know, those websites you go to and you're like, save for later, like I'll read it later. And it turns it into a podcast. So it takes whatever you want to read and then it turns it into like a uh, audio version of it. So you don't have to sit there and read it. You can take it for your walks or whatever. If you're not going to listen to a podcast like ours uh, or whatever, it's a cool way of looking at things differently. Turn written content into a podcast instantly. With eloquence, everything you don't normally have time to read cannot be listened to. Huh. Sign up and we'll send you the app. Brilliant. All right, very cool. I'm in. You know I love to listen. Yeah. You can even, they even have a Chrome extension. Yeah. I don't even have to read anything online. No, that's what I'm saying. You'll love it. Hmm. Okay, I'm in. Well, my tip of the week is, uh, is the best tip of the week because Peter has been kind and generous enough to offer a free book. And just go to petersfreebook.com. Is that right, Peter? That's right, petersfreebook.com. Petersfreebook.com. We'll have a, a link to it in the show notes. And read the book and start learning about lease options and how you can profit from it. So Peter Conti, uh, are we good? I'm, I'm good, yeah. I enjoyed getting to uh, hang out with you guys and uh, hi to everyone out there listening. 
Hope you have All a great right. day and a, a great time making the most of this strange world we're in right now. Fant- yeah, absolutely. Scott Todd, are we good? We're good, Mark. Well, I want to remind the listeners the only way we're going to get the quality of guests like a Peter Connie is if you do those three little favors. You got to subscribe. You got to rate. You got to review the podcast. Send us a screenshot of that review to support at thelandgeek.com. We're going to send you for free the $97 wholetailing course, how to double your money 30 days or less. So please do that. Hopefully you're getting a lot of value from these podcasts and, um, and thank you. So one, two, three, let freedom ring. Thanks everybody.